All right, so just a quick recap on some of the sessions that we've had today. Um, we started off with a, a really interesting keynote from Ben, which gave us some insight into the global B2B payment space, um, and particularly zeroing on the cross-border opportunity and what that's going to look like over the next five to seven years. We then moved into uh, the conversation around you know, compliance considerations and, and regulatory compliance, which I think for the most part, it seems to be right at the heart of, of the conversation around DLT payments. Um, next up, we had a fascinating uh, discussion. I think the, the last panel, there were some really interesting insights um, around you know, changing the financial plumbing and uh, DLT payment rails um, you know, as, a, as an applicable use case. But for the last two talks uh, for today, we'd like to change gears a little bit and um, look at DLT through a product lens. So today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Kike Collin, who is the SVP of Data and Product at Ebury. Kike is a seasoned product and data leader. He began his career at Ebury, where he joined early on and played a pivotal role in building the data and analytics team out from scratch. He was instrumental in supporting the company's growth from 50 to over 1,300 employees and over 150 million pounds in revenue. Kike then transitioned to the fast-moving world of crypto, leading the analytics function at market maker GSR, before more recently rejoining Ebury as SVP of product. So for those of you that don't know Ebury, um, it's a global financial services firm and one of Europe's, Europe's largest fintechs with 32 offices around the world in 20, 21 different countries and currently processing around 21 billion transactions each year. So let's give a round of applause for Kike Colin. Thanks. All right, so Kike, um, yeah, I think the audience is really interested to learn a little bit about you. Tell us some more about your role at Ebury. Um, and I think also importantly, you know, a bit of insight into your crypto journey and, and how you came to uh, to be involved in crypto. Sure. So, uh, yep, joined Ebury quite was my um, first job out of uni. Uh, spent eight years there, building uh, building data from from scratch. Uh, it became a pretty material team uh, to what we do at Ebury, um, all the way from using data science uh, for pricing credit risk, uh, building their whole uh, rec reporting stack as we expanded across 30 jurisdictions. We got acquired by Santander. So Santander bought 51% uh, of the business uh, back in 2020, uh, but uh, they, they, they let us operate quite, quite uh, freely uh, since. And then uh, my crypto journey, I got involved uh, pretty much with the launch of, of Ethereum and the Ethereum ecosystem uh, back in 2015. Uh, and more heavily involved since 2020, since DeFi summer. And at a certain point, I just uh, frustrated sort of with the challenges that we had in traditional finance and seeing the protocols that were being built around automated market makers, uh, uh, yield farming, peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer loan, and, and so on. I just decided to, to jump and, and, and what better place than go to a, the leading market maker in the space. Uh, did that for a year, uh, very fun, uh, very turbulent year. Uh, timing was probably <laughs> a bit laughable, but uh, enjoy that experience. And then I, I felt that I was a bit disconnected from the problem, from the problem space. And I felt uh, that need to go back into the, to the real world and, and solve, uh, be closer to the to customer's problem. So uh, I thought that coming back to Ivory uh, under a, a, a pro role would be, would be the, the right choice. And, and here I am. Amazing. So on the topic of, of problems, right, um, you know, I think we've spoken a lot about some of the challenges in the B2B payments and, and, and cross-border payment space today. Um, but what do, you, what do you think some of the biggest problems are in terms of international payments? And, you know, how does eBury uh, fit into this? And, and how are you guys looking to solve these problems for your customers? Yeah, so look, I'd say that the problems were already laid out by the previous uh, panel, and, and it comes down to probably our, our expectations on uh, how payments should work internationally uh, when it comes to speed, certainty, and cost relative to how they work uh, domestically. There's a, there's a clear mismatch there, right? As for what that means for eBree, uh, we are 
different, I would say, to uh, the, 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 the the companies in the previous panel, in the sense that we are looking to do uh, well what banks do poorly. So we are actually looking to embrace that complexity. So corporate groups, group structures with multiple subsidiaries, complex uh, cash reconciliation uh, issues, uh, running payroll uh, across uh, multiple jurisdictions. That's where we tend to tend to uh, do well, and that's what we look for. Yeah. And what kind of applications uh, of DLT is is Ebri currently looking at and exploring? And um, yeah, how do you see these kind of new payment rails adding value to your customers in the future? Yeah. So I think uh, as the previous panel touched upon, on stable coins becoming an alternative uh, rail. So. What we're seeing, and for us, this is very exploratory at, at, at the moment, right? But I, to second uh, John's point, I think we're interested on, on use cases and applications that are fintech on the front, powered by these rails on the back. But there is that this is being abstracted uh, for the client, right? So more specifically, this would be using uh, USDC rails for specific corridors. We're seeing that already happening for remittances uh, on B2B flows. It's 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 not it's not a requirement per se. We've got very specific examples of clients that are coming to us with those needs, uh, but that would be sort of on the short term. On the long term, uh, what we're monitoring is as you have more stablecoin issuers issuing uh, um, tokenized uh, uh, currencies, right? So you've got USDC, you now have EUROC, you've got a tokenized BRL. This is all on the on the private uh, issuance side. You're starting to see development of on-chain FX markets. So if you right now go to Uniswap, you can actually quote uh, uh, Euro C, USDC, and it's quite, it's quite competitive. There's actually uh, uh, some depth there. So what, the, what does this mean from, a, from an FX standpoint? Uh, what does the future look like when you're looking at 24-7 liquidity, uh, atomic settlement through these rails? That's something super interesting, right? Very, very, very long into the future, but it's something that we are uh, closely watching. Nice. And I think, I mean, you know, we've obviously had a number of different discussions and interactions over the last uh, couple of months. And certainly I know our, our team and our product team has taken some inspiration on, on some of the ideas that you've had around, you know, embedded stablecoin wallets and, uh, and these kind of things too. Um, and you talk a little bit about, you know, short-term use, use cases and, and problems that you feel you can solve for customers. Um, and maybe even some, you know, some some inward demand, right, from from customers for uh, for these type of products. So maybe you can give us some examples of use cases um, that you guys are looking at currently. Yeah. So more specifically, we have we have a, a case, for example, in continental Europe on a on a fishing company that is selling fish uh, worldwide. And when it comes to uh, repatriating, they they sell fish uh, across Africa, for example. And finding that right-hand side liquidity in some jurisdictions can be a can be a challenge, right? And repatriating the proceeds from those sales is a challenge for them. So at the moment they're using uh, stable coins, uh, mainly USDC, and uh, of ramping that through centralized exchanges. So to what extent could we start thinking about our wallet, right, where we're basically uh, wrapping together a bunch of payment rails and linking that to to a corporate identity? How can we start embedding some of these new rails and provide that experience where uh, you see a USDC balance uh, just like you see any other any other fiat currency. All right. And I mean, you know, how, how far are you guys on that journey at the moment? Very early. So as I was saying, it's, it's still uh, very exploratory. I think the, the fact that we don't have a, a clear regulatory framework, um, yeah, as, as wife was saying, uh, and, 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 and this across jurisdictions, it makes it difficult for us to, to be um, uh, first movers in this space. And also there's a repetitional challenge, right, that comes with it. So, uh, of course, we're heavily regulated across multiple jurisdictions. Uh, we have uh, many banking relationships that are very important to us. And not having that clarity or framework, that, that, that makes it a challenge, right? All right. And I mean, you know, do you guys have any, I guess... Um particular strategies that you're following towards, you know, preparing to mitigate some of these challenges, um, you know, when you're looking at from a product perspective? Well, to the extent that we can um, 
externalize that complexity, uh, we would we would uh, uh, seriously consider it, and that's sort of where, where our line of collaboration uh, started, right? Um, yeah, and it, it, it really comes down to 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 going deep into the detail, uh, um, understanding the nuances of the regulation in every jurisdiction, and then having a proper compliance framework that we can share with our liquidity providers, with our partners, and 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 take it from there. Okay, and I mean, you know, we've we've spoken a lot about compliance today. Um, you know, we've heard some industry leaders in in the space, right? Obviously, it's very closely linked to how you think about product design. Um, you know, and, and how you would obviously represent the product from a from a customer perspective. So, you know, maybe can you talk us through some of your experience around that and and how you guys are thinking about it at, at Ebury? So, I think we're thinking about it pretty much uh, like like uh, a, a, any other provider. But I think one very interesting point is uh, in the first panel it was discussed around how these technologies fundamentally bring a new way around, say for example, proving identity or proving source of funds. Uh, I don't think the future will look, we will be applying the same AML uh, techniques and processes when fundamentally we're operating on shared ledgers, right? So, I mean, I, 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 was, I was following up on this tweet uh, over the weekend on, on someone that had actually mapped out the the whole uh, flow of funds from uh, Lazarus Group, the North Korean hacking group that was uh, uh, discussed before, on them having exploited 41,000 ETH, and someone on Twitter just under a pseudonym sh showing the whole flow of funds and how that was being disbursed through three or four centralized exchanges, which actually took the centralized made the centralized exchanges uh, freeze those accounts, right? So. When you're operating in these rails, how you start thinking about uh, proof of identity, source of funds, and so on, I think uh, it requires a completely, uh, yeah, new way of thinking. All right, and I mean, for, for those of us in the audience that are, um, you know, in the product space and, and in product design, you know, what kind of advice would you give to, you know, at fintechs that are looking to build on top of, of crypto rails based on your experience? So probably um, seconding uh, Shelley's point on on being compliant first. So thinking about compliant, it's not. I mean, at the end of the day, I think our business is a trade off between infrastructure, capital, and regulation. So if you need to start somewhere, I would probably start with uh, regulation and thinking how how you're making that a, a moat and a competitive advantage. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I mean, I think from from a commercial perspective, um, you know, from the customers that we are that we are obviously speaking to, you know, education and compliance needs to be right at the forefront of of the way in which we are uh, discussing this topic. Right? I think probably our one of our top performing sales reps is uh, is Marta. Um, she's <laughs> she's in on each and every uh, large pitch that we're that we're doing to different companies in the fintech space. So. Yeah, I completely agree with that point.